Good morning. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is where we'll begin in just a moment. But I'd like to call your attention to a card hopefully you'll see in front of you on the, the pew. Um, and I'd like to take a minute. This is really important to us to get better at communicating with you. You know, recently we had some bad weather come through and we had to cancel kind of suddenly one of our Wednesday night assemblies. And so it's important to us to try to be able to communicate or get a hold of you whenever we can. Even though it's been, what, in the 60s the last few days, winter's not over probably. Amen? So there's always a chance. And so on this card, on the other side, there's some information. And basically, it's your contact information. If you would let us know what is the best way for us to contact you. It's complicated nowadays because you got, you got what, telephones, you got texts, and you got emails, and you got smoke signals and everything else. And so if you would let us know how we could get a hold of you, that would help us a lot. I'm going to ask you to do that right now, and we're going to collect them just in a, in a couple of minutes. Shouldn't take too long. I made a mistake in first service. Oh, by the way, where it says attend first or second service, check second service. That's where you are today. Does that make sense? They didn't laugh at that either the last time, Jason. I thought it'd be, I thought it'd be good by now. Don't you like how Jason, before I get up to preach, says, let's stretch our legs? Don't you? I don't really, I don't know about that. Uh, the main thing here is if you prefer, like I do, I prefer to get a text because I can look at it. It's there to refer to later. We're going to need your carrier information. We've got a really good uh, software tool that we can use to send out communication like that, but we do need that information. Uh, I didn't make a mistake in first service. I didn't explain it's one per person because I had several people tell me their husbands filled it out and they're still not going to get any information. Well, there's a second joke that didn't work. I know. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I'm trying. I got to get a new writer. Anyway, uh, if you fill that out and and hopefully individually, and then if you would, go ahead and pass it into those center aisles, and we'll get those collected. So we've got your name, your contact information, and your banking number. Okay, that's the third joke. That's not on there. All right, so if you would go ahead and fill that out, and if you want to go ahead and pass it to the, to the aisle, we'll go ahead and collect those from you real quick. It's a little bit disruptive, but we really do value being able to communicate with you when we need to, and so that helps us. So while they're collecting that and while you're finishing that up, we'll kind of connect with where we were last week. We began last Sunday talking about discipleship, and we said that the simplest and I think the most profound way to define discipleship is to follow Jesus. If that's not true, then anything else that we do just honestly doesn't make any sense and isn't relevant at all. In Genesis chapter 3, we read about the fall of man where, where Adam and Eve both chose to defy God and how everything changed. But I'd like you to notice, and honestly, if you look in chapter 2, we're going to compare a couple of verses. In chapter 2, verse 9, there's an interesting expression about how God is creating the various things. And in verse 9, he talks about the fruited trees. Verse 9, he says, this is Genesis 2, verse 9. He says, out of the ground, the Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So when he describes the fruited trees in general, he says again, verse 9 says, pleasing to the sight and good for food. Now you notice we looked at last week. Now look at chapter 3 when it describes how Eve is being tempted to eat of this fruit that's going to change everything. Chapter 3, verse 6. Oh, by the way, if you give Eve or Adam a hard time for messing up the world we live in, I've thought that before. I thought, you know, how, how fair is it that they made those decisions and I get to live in a world that's broken? And then I asked myself, okay, what if God said, well, you're right, Mike. I hadn't thought about that. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll reset the world. We'll put everybody back in the garden and they get to stay as long as you don't sin. Yeah, okay, we end up in the same spot pretty quickly, don't we? But listen to the temptation or the description in chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. Now, wait a minute. Let's read how it's described again. Verse 6. 
She saw the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes. Chapter 2, verse 9. He caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. So why is it listed in chapter 3 as if it's part of what is tantalizing or tempting? And the third element, even in chapter 3, and it was desirable to make one wise. Isn't it a good thing to be wise? Isn't the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes and other wisdom literature, isn't it about the benefit of gaining wisdom? So what is it about this temptation that causes such havoc and such destruction? God has given us our appetites. And they are, in and of themselves, inherently good. I'll give you an example. God gave you the appetite to eat. But not just a normal sort of appetite. In other words, eating is not just about, oh, my body's low on fuel. I need to eat some nutrition. So let me get some celery and some bean sprouts and some lemongrass and and get all fueled up, right? Am I connecting with you? No, right? It's not just about eating, because our dogs can eat anything. Have you noticed? Or teenage boys, same thing. But the rest of us have, have taste buds and discerning palates, and we put a tremendous amount of energy in how our food tastes. There's cooking shows and cook-offs and cookbooks and you name it. It's all about that special flavor or spice or thing that we eat and we go, ooh, Is that a bad thing? No, it's a gift from God that we not only need to eat, but that we can receive pleasure from eating, that it's enjoyable, that it's an experience, that it's something to to remember. But then Satan takes a God-given appetite and twists it. And then it becomes toxic, destructive. Can eating or an appetite to eat ever become spiritually toxic or unhealthy? Well, sure. For example, if you have a head cold and it's miserable outside and it's terrible weather, what's better than a steaming bowl of homemade chicken noodle soup? That just, is that not comforting? But what's interesting is we can turn to food for comfort well past chicken noodle soup, can't we? So we can have problems with overeating. We could have the opposite problem. We could have problems with bulimia or anorexia. That all of a sudden this whole food thing gets weird and gets twisted and becomes unhealthy. That's what Satan does with what is good. So what is it about the temptation in Genesis chapter 3? Well, before we go any further, let's pray together and get some help. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to come together, Lord. And and as we assemble this morning, we now ask for your help. Lord, we praise you for your wisdom, for your power, for your grace, and for your patience. And Lord, we ask that you would guide us, that you would lead us, that you would bring us to where you want us to be. Help us, Lord, to be willing, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So when Eve looks at the tree, it looks good, it tastes good. And it would make one wise, so where's the problem? Why is this so destructive? Remember when Satan quotes back to her the words of God but twisted around in verse 2, the woman tells Satan about how we're not allowed to do this. Look at verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. There's the first lie. For God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. What's the temptation? To be like God. It's not that it's wisdom, it's wisdom that replaces God. Just like my comfort food. Why am I going to the refrigerator when I should be going to prayer? Nothing wrong with the refrigerator, I'm kind of glad it's there. But what if it replaces God? So now the problem is a proclaimed wisdom that replaces God. I don't need God, I'll figure it out on my own. I got this handled, I can do this, I'm smart enough. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, remember that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So what Satan is doing is replacing in this wisdom, replacing God. Turn over, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul talks about this in a fairly similar way. 
For wisdom, by definition, is simply gaining knowledge in a way that you're able to apply it. We call it applied knowledge. It's not just knowing something, but you know what to do with it. That's wisdom. But the challenge or the temptation is, will you follow God's wisdom or do you desire to follow your own or to replace God? So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 Paul says, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was then well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews the stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Satan's temptation then and now is that we would decide that we don't need Jesus. That we don't need to be saved. I'm not that bad. There's people that are a lot worse. It's not that big a deal. And I can handle this. I'm smart enough. I'll do this on my own. Thank you very much. That's a claim of wisdom, but it isn't a wisdom that works. Turn over to John chapter 3. Let's see if we can see an example of how this works out in two different people's lives. John chapter 3. Now in my Bible, this is going to be convenient because I have John chapter 3 on the left and John chapter 4 on the right. You're going to want to put your ribbon there. We're going to bounce between these two chapters, and I hope that's not a lot of page turning for you. I don't know if that's a swipe left or a swipe right for you if you're not reading out of the, the real Bible, if yours is electronic. But in John chapter 3... Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Now he's identified as a ruler of the Jews. And from what we see in the context and what we know about him in a few other places, he is a Pharisee. He is religiously trained. He's experienced. He's respected. He's successful. He's quite a guy. He's a good guy. And when he comes to Jesus, he says, Rabbi. He calls him Rabbi in the opening verses in verse 2. He says, Rabbi... We know that you've come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs unless you've come from God. So when he calls him rabbi, especially for Nicodemus, this is a title of great respect. It means teacher, but it's, it's more like master teacher or something of that nature. It's an elevated position of respect. So he addresses Jesus that way. That's his language, Nicodemus' language. And then he says, you, you, you got to be from God because no one else can do these signs. So Nicodemus is in a great place. But there is a hint of what's wrong. That is that he's come to Jesus by night. He's not willing to talk to Jesus in front of others. So we're talking about discipleship is the decision to follow Christ I'm going to suggest this morning that to be a disciple, to follow, you also have to leave. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus calls Peter to follow him, they leave their nets and follow him. When Jesus said to Matthew in chapter 9 of the book of Matthew, follow me, Matthew leaves his tax collector's booth and follows him. To follow you must also leave. So when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus calls him rabbi, rabbi, recognizes his works, and then Jesus says in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What a unique expression. You've got to be born again. You've got to be remade. Everything's got to be new. Everything has to be completely recreated as different ways maybe of saying that. But my question this morning is, why does he say that to Nicodemus? Because this kind of language is the only time Jesus says this to Nicodemus. So look across at chapter 4. 
Chapter 4 is a very different person. In the opening verses of chapter 4, there's going to be a Samaritan woman. That Jesus is in Samaria, he's stopped there by a well, and the Samaritan woman comes out in the middle of the day, about noon, while the disciples are off to town to buy lunch. It's just Jesus by the well, and the Samaritan woman comes. Now, if you know the background, this is already startling and would make you uneasy. The Samaritans were a people of mixed race and mixed culture. They're mixed of Jews and the Gentiles. There is tremendous cultural prejudice and even hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. She's also a woman. And so in those days, especially Samaritan women were looked down upon. I'm told one of the expressions of Jewish males of the day was it would be better to marry a dog than a Samaritan woman. So here's a person so opposite of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is, he's all that. He's, he's successful and he's, he's respected and, and he has a great position. And it's almost like, how far away can you go from Nicodemus? Oh, I don't know. Maybe all the way to a Samaritan woman in the very next chapter. One of the least respected people in their world. But there's even one more layer because the fact that Jesus meets her, she's coming to get water from the well in the middle of the day is unusual. Generally, women would do those things together, generally in the morning or maybe in the evening. Have you noticed that when ladies go somewhere, they often do things together? I'm not going to explain that. I'm just going to suggest that, okay? And what's true then? Is this just what they did? It was part of their uh, societal relationship, a chance to catch up with each other. It's their fellowship time. So the fact that she's alone in the middle of the day suggests that she is an outcast in her own world. In other words, she can't even get along with other Samaritan women. So what a contrast between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. So when Nicodemus says, going back to chapter 3, Rabbi, we know you're from God, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, Now, he says that. Some older Bibles say, verily, verily, if you remember, or you may be reading that today. That is specific rabbinic language. That's the way rabbis talked. Um, Have you ever known any preachers that have the annoying habit of always saying exactly the same thing every time they start? You don't know me either. One of the things interesting is, is... Over the last 30 years, this obviously is primarily how I speak in a public setting. And when I end, I always end the same way with the same words, right? I always say, and now let us stand and sing. Don't do it right now. I thought you were going to do it for a second. It's not over. But I always end with stand and sing because that's what we're doing is we're offering an invitation. Well, at one particular occasion, I was speaking at a high school graduation, and I was telling myself, don't end that way. This is different, so don't, don't do that, don't do that. And you know how it is when you have a habit, it's so ingrained, you don't think about it. So I'm, I'm talking to the seniors, and I'm challenging them, and I'm encouraging them. And I get to the very end, and I said, and now let us stand. And I froze, like, oh, no. And now let us stand, I said, for what we all believe in. And then I... I got off the stage as quick as I could. My point is, when Jesus says this, it's recognized. It's a signal. It's like, oh, it's the way rabbis spoke. So he calls Jesus a rabbi, so Jesus talks like one. What's fascinating, he doesn't talk like that at all with the woman at the well, does he? There's no truly, truly when he speaks with the woman. So he tells Nicodemus, you got to be born again. And you can appreciate, you and I know the full context, but if you were getting it on the fly like Nicodemus, you could understand his confusion. Look at verse 4. This is chapter 3, verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? We can appreciate that. You think, well, that doesn't, what? That doesn't make sense. So now it's fascinating that Jesus who would know Nicodemus' heart and would know his confusion, this would be a good time to Jesus to say, well, now what I mean is, but he doesn't. He just hammers down. Look at verse 5. He continues. He says, truly, truly, there's that same language, like, listen, you really need to pay attention. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. There's a lot in here. We're not going to be able to investigate in this setting everything that this means. We're looking for simply one point today. But can you appreciate Nicodemus going, uh, he was already confused. How can that be? And then Jesus really lays it on even, even more intensely. And you can appreciate where Nicodemus could have been like, I look over in chapter 4. So the woman comes out to the well, verse 7. There's no truly, truly here. In fact, Jesus initiates the conversation this time. And he said to her, give me a drink. Simple request. Yeah, not really. Not in their culture and not in that context. Because you see her response in verse 9. It says, therefore the Samaritan woman said, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan? Then John gives you the parenthetical because Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans, which is an understatement. So here's a Samaritan woman all by herself in the heat of the day coming to get water. And a Jewish man says, give me a drink. Do you suppose she's used to ridicule? Do you suppose that she's used to being looked down upon? I, in my opinion, I see her leaning back when she says that, almost like, what are you trying to do? I'm just trying to get water. Just, I don't need this. Can you just leave me alone? Because she asked, why, and essentially, why are you asking me? Because this has got to be a setup. It's got to be some sort of beginning conversation, and then he's going to really make her feel bad. That would be what she would be accustomed to. Jesus says, verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Let me ask you an important question. Can Jesus speak plainly? Is he capable of that? Then what is this? This is intentional. What's he doing? And perhaps more importantly, why? Because this is, can I just call it crazy talk? This is, whoa. All she was doing was just trying to get some water. And some Jewish guy starts this weird conversation. That she's pretty sure isn't going to end well for her. It normally doesn't. And then he says, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd really want some of this water. And she says, verse 11, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get such living water? Nicodemus said, how how are you going to be born again? You're not even going to fit. Isn't that what he said? And she says, how are you going to get water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? He said, no one can be from God unless he does these things. She said, "Are are you saying you can do something that Jacob can't do? Jesus replies, I'm not talking about water. I'm talking about if you trust me and have a relationship with me, I will save you. That's what I thought he was going to say. That would explain himself, right? That's not what he does. Like Nicodemus, he just takes it further. Listen to what he says. This is verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Brothers and sisters, friends and guests, there's so much here. We spend our whole lives soaking literally in his words, but she's getting it on the fly. She doesn't get to say, let me back up and read that again. 
She's hearing it coming at her. Can you see her face going, what are you talking about? And if she's accustomed to rejection and ridicule and oppression, then that's what she's waiting on. So what is he setting her up for? What, what's the joke that she doesn't know the punchline to? What's the insult that's coming next? Verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. I like the way you talk. I don't know exactly what you mean. She's missing it, right? He's talking about eternity and he's talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And she's thinking, man, that would save me a walk every day. What's Jesus doing and why is it important? Let's go back to John chapter 3. So he has a different but similar conversation with Nicodemus. You've got to be born again. You've got to be recreated. It's all got to start over again. Why would you say that to Nicodemus? I think the point, perhaps the answer, is verse 10. Because in verse 9, Nicodemus said, how can these things be? You're losing me. I don't get it. And Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? You know, I think is interesting is probably Nicodemus could have anticipated being respected and the woman at the well could have anticipated being ridiculed. But if either one of them catches a zinger, guess who gets it? It's not the woman. Nicodemus. You're the teacher of Israel and you don't know this? Well, now let's see. As a Pharisee, as a ruler of the Jews... As a religious leader, he's got all the education and the background and the training and all that stuff. And Jesus says, what, you don't know this? What's Nicodemus being asked to leave? Because remember, to follow Jesus requires to leave something first. When he called Peter, surrounded by a net full of fish, he said, follow me. And Jesus and Peter left everything and followed Jesus. When he said to Matthew, follow me, he got up, walked out of his tax collector booth, left it behind him and followed Jesus. What's Nicodemus being asked to leave? What does he have to walk away from? Man, this guy's smart. He's educated. He knows stuff. I'm a third generation preacher. Our whole family's loud and annoying. I have a rich heritage in the church, and I speak church fluently. Is anybody else been raised up in the church their whole life? Anybody? So let me talk to usins here for a second. The rest of you just politely go to sleep for a little bit. What are our issues as Christians? Now, I understand lumping that all in a big box is sort of challenging, but when I open the Bible and I read something, or I ask you to read something, have you not read it before? Didn't you go to every VBS? Haven't you made Moses' basket? Huh? And haven't you made sheep out of cotton balls and tongue depressors? We know this stuff. So there's very, very few times that I'm going to hear something that, well, I didn't know that was there. Not in the general sense. There's always more, right? But you get where I'm going? If I say, I want to tell you about Moses, you know who that is. If I say, let's sing number 728B, you know what song that is, don't you? So what's the, and that's a, hair, that's a beautiful thing. That's not a negative thing. So what are my challenges? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I know that already. Heard that already. Got it. So my problem is I might be tempted to be a little bit apathetic, a little bit bored, a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. To follow Jesus is to leave something. What's Nicodemus being called to leave? His identity is the teacher of Israel. He has this wisdom, but has it led him to Christ? That's the question. 
Because when Eve was tempted with wisdom, it was wisdom that would turn her away from God. That would say, I know God said that, but I'm going to trust something else instead. The wisdom that replaces God, the worldly wisdom that turns us away from God, that was the temptation. And Nicodemus has to choose to follow Jesus Christ. To do that, he's going to have to leave this identity as, I am the expert of the Jews. Now, that can be tough to do, can't it? But not everybody's Nicodemus. Not everybody knows all the VBS stories. You may never, ever have made a sheep out of cotton balls, and I'm so sorry for you. But I bet we'll let you in a special adult class if you'd like. Everybody has challenges and issues. So what's the woman's issue? If Nicodemus is maybe, maybe if it's, yeah, yeah, I know this, or maybe it's apathy, or maybe it's, well, this is my identity, it's all this stuff I know. Because when you're in a Bible class and it occurs to you, hey, I need to ask a question. Do you know who the least likely person to ask a question in class is, in a Bible class? Me. Because I'm supposed to know everything. So I'm not about to ask a question and admit I don't know something because I'm supposed to know everything. See, those of us like Nicodemus can be impaired in our ability to learn because we're frozen by I'm already supposed to know. So when Jesus is talking to the woman, though, and he's offering her this water. And then she says, give me this water. This would be great. What's he say? He doesn't say, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't understand water? That wouldn't apply at all. Here's what he says. Chapter 4, verse 16. He said to her, go, call your husband and come here. What does that have to do with anything? Where'd that come from? Why is he asking about her husband now? That's out of the blue. She says, and in my mind's eye, she leans back from him because here it comes. She knew it. I knew it. This is what happens to me every time. I should have never gotten in this conversation. I should have never made eye contact because here comes the ridicule. Here comes the judgment and the rejection because she says, I have no husband. I think she raised one eyebrow and leaned into it a little bit. I have no husband as a warning sign. Don't you do it. I don't have to take this from you, not today. You may be all that, but I don't have to hear it from you. She says, I have no husband. And Jesus says, I know. He says, you are correct for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your own I think I know why she comes to the well in the middle of the day don't you I think I know why she's used to rejection I don't know why she's had five failed relationships we're not told maybe they all passed away but no matter how it's happened, would you agree there's a lot of pain down that road? Even in the best case scenario that none of it was her fault, is there not a lot of pain down that road? Why is Jesus asking her that? He reaches out and probes the most painful thing in her life. He said to Nicodemus, aren't you a teacher of Israel and you don't know this because that's his identity? I ask you, what is her identity? If his is, well, I'm, I'm the expert, is hers, I'm the injured one. Have you ever done that? Have you ever cloaked yourself in your pain and that becomes your identity? Have you ever said, well, I would, but I was mistreated. I would do this, but I was spoken to in a painful or hurtful way. Have you ever used your pain as an excuse have you ever worn it so long that that's the way you think of yourself? I'm the broken one. Yeah, I'm the black sheep in the family. I'm the one that puts fun and dysfunctional. I'm the messed up one, you know. It appears that she, her identity is wrapped up in her failure. 
if you have to leave in order to follow, what is Jesus asking her to leave? That. That. Because it has defined her, it has poisoned every relationship. Her expectation of rejection and ridicule causes her to anticipate that in the next relationship. Do you know anybody like that? They're automatically going to read between the lines, they're going to assume, and they're going to see in others in anticipation this injury so they won't engage, so they won't connect, so they won't communicate. In both cases, Jesus says, to follow me, you must leave who you think you are. Nicodemus had his wisdom, but so did she. She had a life wisdom that she had learned and learned how to cope with it and learned how to deal with it, and she's got to leave it because it's going to replace God. You tell me. When you wear pain like that, what do you do when you read where Jesus says, if you don't forgive your brother from your heart, then neither will your father forgive you? What do you do with that verse? If you're wearing your pain, if that's a part of your identity, you will find an exception to that verse for you. Yeah, but you don't understand. This is different. And you will withdraw from God because it's become your identity. What does he ask her to leave? That's not who she is. That's not who she should be. Here's what's beautiful, though, is she's asked the question about worship, and they get into a conversation about where worship is. And then in verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, and it's the first time she's the first person, this broken, this Samaritan woman who's at the well, who's in all of this failure, she's the first one. He looks her right in the eye, and he says, I am. As far as we can tell, he hasn't even told the disciples that, not in such a clear way. He tells her, I am. And she makes a decision. She leaves in order to follow. In verse 28, the woman left her water pot, went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they come streaming out of the village to see somebody who could change such a wreck like her. To be a disciple is to follow Jesus. But if you're going to follow him, you're going to have to leave. So my question this morning is, what is it that you need to leave? Is it your success? Or is it your failure? Perhaps you identified with Nicodemus today and said, boy, yeah, I know, I understand that. Maybe you identified with her and said, oh, yeah, I, boy, I understand that. What is it that you need to leave in order to follow Jesus as together we stand and sing?